Good morning and welcome to video worship for Stewartstown Presbyterian Church for this week. It is great that we can be together even if we have to do it virtually. We have a couple of announcements to start us off. First, there is a blood drive coming up at SPC on August 25th. Uh, you need to call in ahead of time. The number is on the worship notes. Uh, call in ahead of time and reserve a spot. But we'd love for you to come out. We uh, would love to uh, be able to support the blood drive, especially during this time. Uh, there's a big need for blood donors. So if you're able to give, uh, please mark August 25th on your calendar and uh, plan to, uh, to call ahead and come out for your appointment uh, to donate blood. Also in our prayer list this week or in our announcements this week, uh, thank you to uh, so many people who offered their uh, thoughts and prayers for me. Um, I am doing just fine and uh, all goes well. We will be in parking lot worship tomorrow morning at 930. But I was a little concerned that I might be contagious and I'm not. But I was concerned and so we skipped last week and uh, now we're ready to be back live and in person. Uh, so that will be wonderful to be together again. Uh, that is the only announcements I have. Uh, there will be a session meeting and trustee meeting this week. At least I think there's a trustee meeting. But there is definitely a session meeting. Uh, so uh, elders and trustees, please check your email on Tuesday this week uh, for details for your meeting. And now let us prepare for worship through the music of the prelude. I invite you to join with me in the call to worship. It is printed on our worship notes or it should appear on the screen. Let us be called to worship. Happy is the person who doesn't listen to the wicked or follow others down the wrong path. Happy is the person who delights in the teaching of the Lord. That person thrives like a tree planted beside streams of water. The Lord guards the way of the righteous. The Lord quenches our souls and guides our lives with his word. Let us worship God and let us turn to God in prayer. We lift up our voices to you, O God. We lift up our voices in thanks and praise to you, for you are a great and awesome God who has blessed us with grace and love in a time of anger and hatred. You have blessed us with a peace that passes understanding in a time of confusion and frustration. 
You have blessed us with acceptance in a time of rejection. So we lift our voices in praise and our hearts swell in joy as we worship you this day, Lord. Draw us close to you, dear Jesus. Draw us close by the power of your love that as we prepare to worship, we might be prepared to learn from you, that we might learn your ways of peace and justice, that we might learn to walk your path of wholeness and grace, that we might walk in your way of love. O Spirit divine, open our eyes that we might see all around us your glory and creative power. Open our eyes that we might behold each flower and each fellow human with reverence for your handiwork. Fill us with wonders as we behold your world. Fill us with wonder as we see that which is strange or different, that we might appreciate the great variety of your creative power. O oh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we bow our hearts and lives before you this day as we prepare to worship and adore you, O Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We continue our reading from the book of Genesis, this time now from chapters 37, verses 1 to 4, and verses 12 to 28. Listen for God's word. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. And this is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. 
and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons, because he had been born to him in his old age, and he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Now his brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, As you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I'm going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. So he said to him, Go, and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks, and bring word back to me. Then he sent him off from the valley of Hebron. When Joseph arrived at Shechem, a man found him wandering around in the fields and asked him, What are you looking for? He replied, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they're grazing their flocks? They have moved on from here, the man answered. I heard them say, Let's go to Dorthan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dorthan. But they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns, and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into this cistern here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing. They took him and threw him into a cistern. The cistern was empty and there was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices and balm and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. And Judah said to his brothers, What will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he's our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites, who took him to Egypt. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hi everybody, happy Sunday to you. Um, wish we could do this in person like we do every summer, but um, given our uh, times now, we'll have to do it this way. So, got a little hymn for you today. Hope you guys enjoy it. Shall we gather at the river where bright angel feet have trod with its crystal tide forever flowing by the throne of God? the 
shining river, soon our pilgrimage will cease. Soon our happy hearts will quiver with the melody of peace. Yes, we'll gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful Sunday, everybody. Family Troubles. The Good Lie is a movie from 2014 about some brothers who were in Sudan, Africa. Their family lived in a little village in the Sudan when it was struck by soldiers fighting a civil war, the second civil war in Sudan in recent years. Their entire village was killed, but these six siblings, five boys and one girl, made it out. They hid in the bush, they went through the woods, they finally made their way to a camp. But along the way, one of the brothers died. And along the way, the oldest brother gave himself up to save the rest of his family. Uh, the movie is a wonderful movie. It is full of faith and humor and a few tears. And it is a wonderful story about how this family reunites themselves. Well, in a refugee camp for a decade, they finally hit the lottery and they win a chance to come to the United States. And now these four siblings find their way to the United States where immediately their sister is taken away from them and sent to another part of the country. That's just the way it goes. You should be happy for her, of course. And this little family that had struggled through the grimy, horrible events of war and refugee camps found their hardest season to be in America. In the cold and emotionally callous place of America, they found it hard to hold together, found it hard to find their way. And in that time, two of the brothers had trouble with each other. That's not very surprising. That's hardly anything of note. It's hard enough for families to get along in the best of times. And this was hardly the best of times. But the two brothers managed to reconcile. And eventually, the family sort of manages to be reunited. And in a number of ways, that story in the movie called The Good Lie reminds me of our story from the book of Genesis. It is about family separation. It is about family troubles. Oh sure, the story has a fair amount of humor and faith in it, but a fair amount of trouble too. For the last few weeks, we have been reading our way through the book of Genesis, and we have been looking at Abraham and Abraham's son Isaac, and Isaac's son Jacob, who becomes Israel. And now this week, the family troubles and the family move down to the next generation as we look at the children of Israel. I had noted before that there was not a small amount of family conflict in this family. Abraham had several children that couldn't get along with each other, and of course, Jacob and Esau were like oil and water and couldn't get along for the longest time. And now we see the family troubles have moved down to the next generation. Now last week we saw a significant turning point as Jacob decided that he would leave the land of Laban, his uncle, and move back to his family home, that he would move back to his brother. A decision that was really a life or death decision. Along the way back, he ran into an old friend, God. And I said last week that Jacob wrestled, and what I meant was that he continued to wrestle with God. 
And this time he did not let go. And this time he wins a blessing. And he goes from heel grabber Jacob to Israel, the patriarch, the one who struggled with God. And this week the story continues. Since the story last week, several events have happened. Jacob had one daughter, Dinah, and about the time she is a young woman, she is attacked by some of the locals who want her to be their wife. But the brothers can't stand for that sort of dishonoring. And so there's a little bit of a war that goes on and the brother Reuben, who is the oldest, takes revenge on a whole village, much to his father's disappointment. And much to his father's sorrow, his precious wife passes away as she gives birth to her last child, a son named Benjamin. And now Jacob has 12 sons. 12 sons who would grow into becoming the 12 tribes of Israel. That is, if they don't kill each other first. And in our story today, we see that that is a very real possibility. Now, since last week, Jacob has also reconciled with his brother. They're not the best of buddies, but at least they're not trying to kill each other anymore. And Jacob has made his home and settled in and is raising his family and they are in turn raising his sheep and taking care of his lands. And the story this week is of the son Joseph. Now, Jacob's two wives, Rachel and Leah, had always been competitive with each other and they passed that on to their children who were also very competitive with each other. Although competitive is not quite the right word. That sounds like they liked playing football together or liked doing sports or wrestling together. It might be better to say that the boys were threatened by each other. After all, they were 12 and they couldn't all be dad's favorites and they couldn't all lay claim to the family inheritance. And Rachel and Leah had wrestled with the family honor and the family leadership while they were both alive. And now that is passed on to the children. Well, the tension becomes a little more acute as we move down to this generation of boys and as we open our story for today. It seems that Dad has a favorite, Joseph. And he has given Joseph an amazing Technicolor dream coat. Okay, that phrase is copyrighted, but he's given Joseph a wonderful tunic, a wonderful prized garment that marks him as a special boy. And he is dad's special boy, much to the disappointment of all of his brothers. But not only has dad named him a special boy, but Joseph has had a dream. And in his dream, he has imagined his brothers bowing down before him. Now, what do you think that means, brothers? Well, it means they've had enough of him and his ways. They've had enough of this little boy. And besides all that, Joseph has brought a bad report about some of the brothers while they were watching the sheep. And the story is that four of the brothers, the, the sons of Bilal and Zilpah, that is, the slave girls of the mothers, and those are the kids who are probably the lowest on the totem pole, they have done something bad. The word here is a little hard to translate, but it means something like they have brought back a, a treacherous word or a scandalous word. And we don't know exactly what it meant, but it seems that maybe they were talking badly about that. Maybe they were talking about doing him in or stealing his stuff, or maybe they had done something scandalous like sell some of the sheep. It doesn't really matter. It, what matters is that they had had enough of this daddy's boy, Joseph, and they were ready to kill him. 
Well, as our story opens, Joseph, Dad's special boy, is home with Dad, playing Nintendo or PlayStation or something like that. When Dad tells him to pack up his stuff and head off to check on the brothers. Now, we don't know if uh, Joseph wanted to stay home or his dad needed him at home or if he wasn't really old enough to be out on the road so many days. Or maybe his brothers didn't want him to come along. After all, who needs a tattletale along when the boys are out on the town? And the boys are out quite a ways away. They have gone off some 50 miles to the area of near the Shephelah in Israel, near the fertile fields and valleys, and then another 13 miles farther on to Dortham. And there they are grazing and taking care of the sheep and doing whatever they want to do, as young men might do, when their brother appears in the distance. Now, Joseph has made his way this 60, 65 miles. He's made his way as a young teenager or 20-something. He's made his way even through maybe bandits or wild animals or the dark of night. He has made his way through several nights on the road. And he has survived all of those dangers to find that the most treacherous thing in the world just might be family. His family. His brothers. And while he's at a distance, they conspire to kill him. Well, let's not get his blood on our hands. Let's throw him into a cistern. Now, cisterns are like deep wells that gather up the spring rains and hold it in the seasons. And in the off-seasons, they're dry, so they decided they would just toss him down there and be done with him. Take his garments, dip it in blood, tell Dad he's gone, and that's that. So much for him. But their plans are a little fluid. Reuben, the oldest, would like to rescue him. But before that can happen, the other brothers have decided to sell him sell him to some of great-granddad Abraham's cousins, the Ishmaelites. And they'll sell him off to those family members and make a pretty coin. What a great deal. They get rid of Joseph, they don't get his blood on their hands, and they get some money out of the deal. It's a wonderful deal. God is good, they must have said to themselves. Later, Reuben shows up in camp and goes off looking in the cistern, trying to rescue his brother, but his brother is gone. He tears his clothes, he rents his heart. How could he be gone just like that? They get home and they tell their dad, here is this cloak, this tunic, this coat of many colors. It looks an awful like, like your son Joseph's cloak doesn't it? And look here, is this blood? And their father draws his own conclusions. They never lied, mind you. They just pointed to these things and he drew his own conclusions. And Father Jacob was unconsolable. Unconsolable. Such was his grief. Such was his despair. His child is gone, his special child. And we don't really know what was the nature of this connection between Jacob and Joseph, whether it was just like a grandfather and son or a son born to an old man, or whether Joseph was something special. Later he has more dreams and later he makes quite a success of himself despite being a slave. Maybe we would call him a mystic or a clairvoyant or a futurist. In psychological terms, maybe he would be listed as somebody on the spectrum of autism. Maybe he's an, an autistic savant or he has Asperger's. But whatever it is, he is a special child. And his father is unconsolable. 
that he let his child go off into the world and his son is gone. He had thought he had been prepared. He had thought he'd been ready. He had thought he would be safe. And now he's gone. What grief, what loss, what guilt, what pain fell upon him. So it is in this story. And it's pretty remarkable that he goes on and does great things. And it would be easy for us to jump to that part of the story. But what do we make of this part of the story? What do we make of this ancient tale in our modern world? Well, for the ancient people, maybe this was a simple morality tale, a simple lesson to be learned. Like, don't mess with your brothers or they might kill you. Like, families better get along or people get killed. Uh, sort of like that Ten Commandment, honor your father and mother, that your days would be long in the land in which you live. Because if you don't honor your father and mother in the ancient world, you just might find yourself honor killed. So maybe this is a lesson about how dangerous the world can be and how families better hold together or they'll fall apart. And the ancient world was a dangerous place. It was dangerous in so many ways. But to be fair, the modern world is pretty dangerous too. The modern world can be dangerous in places like the Sudan, where those brothers and sisters were from who made the movie The Good Lie. Places that are dangerous like Central America, where refugees flee on just the chance that they'll get to the United States and maybe get to stay. The world is a dangerous place in places like China, where peasants flee villages in the rural areas to live in slums in the city, hoping to strike it rich, or where people die in refugee camps. In fact, Outside of some places like America and Europe and some other great places, there are a lot of dangerous places in the world. A lot of places where the world is not very safe. And there are still people, still people fleeing for their lives, still people caught up in slavery. Even in this day and age, there are millions of people sold into slavery in one form or another. People bought and sold for a meal or a rent payment or just because they can't afford them any longer or just because they can get rid of them. People traded off around the world and given away like they're some sort of Amazon gift card. And it's easy to read this story and romanticize it. Easy to read this story and say it's in the Bible and therefore it happens happily ever after and God is good and watches over the whole thing and it's easy to imagine that all of this happens without any tears because really we don't get any tears in this story. We don't get Joseph crying that he's been sold by his family into slavery. He has no time or place for that. Any more than the brothers in The Good Lie had time to complain. And in, in that story too, just like this story, there, there's really no time for lawyers and news cameras and press statements. There's such a thin line between life and death for some people in our world that it's all they can do to just get by all they can do to survive. And as I think about what does this story mean to us today? What does it mean to me? I think maybe it is just a reminder that we are to walk with those who struggle, at least for just a ways. That it's so easy to turn the page, so easy to move on in the story, so easy to get to the happy ending or the good parts, so easy to get bored with struggles or bored with grief or bored with protests or bored with political troubles. And yet those are the struggles we're expected 
to walk into and carry and share together. Perhaps this story reminds me that we are expected to walk in lonesome valleys and hard places with slave children and refugees and those who are oppressed and those who sit in unjust places. Perhaps we're to just hear a little bit of their story and try to sort out how to make their lives a little better, to have the courage to work and be patient to carry their struggles forward a little bit farther down the road, to work on solutions a little bit harder for them, to work on reuniting families and building bridges and stopping injustices and helping people. In the movie The Good Lie, just like this story, things turn out pretty much happily ever after. And the story turns out just fine. But perhaps the reminder here is not to jump to the happy ending too quickly, but not to expect the economic problems or the political problems to go away too quickly, but instead to walk with those problems, walk with those families, walk with those griefs, walk with those struggles. That's the story of Joseph this day, that we are to walk with those in trouble, for this is God's world. Amen. Let us pray. O oh Lord God, you have given us the sun and the rain. You have given us food and friends. You have given us love and grace when you have forgiven us and gave us purpose and meaning when you welcomed us into your kingdom and called us to be your children. Forgive our restless hearts, O Lord, for at times we have wanted so much more than you have offered. We have sought material blessings in abundance. We have listened to the whispering of the world and long for luxuries and wild experiences. At times we have wanted more than we have needed, and at times we have settled for so much less than you've offered us. You offered honest relationships, but at times we hid our true selves and accepted shallow relationships. You offered meaning and purpose, but at times we have sought distractions. Within your love there is room for work and rest and leisure and love but at times we have settled for our lives out of balance. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus, have mercy on us. By the power of your Spirit, redeem and heal us. By the power of your Holy Spirit, continue to rebuild and remake us into your holy people, into your servant people, into your blessed children. As you help and heal us, Lord, we pray that you might enable and empower and excite us to help and heal our world. Give us eyes to see those who suffer needlessly and hearts to help. Give us courage to seek real action and the patience of saints as we work with others to make change happen in our world. We pray for medical staff around the world using their skill to help COVID patients. We pray for researchers using their brains and training to find a cure and treatment. We pray also this morning for our missionaries, Mats and Lauren Brockmeyer, who have finally started their journey to Spain. We pray, Lord, for their posting there and for their work in Europe. We ask your blessing upon them for safety and for effective ministry. We pray, Lord, for the Southern York Food Bank, for the Columbia Presbyterian Church Hands Across the Street Ministry. We pray for so many others who are in the trenches, seeking to help people whose lives have fallen apart in the midst of our economic upheaval, in the midst of so many changes. Lord, may your spirit encourage and strengthen them and may our efforts support them in their ministry. 
We ask this in the name of Jesus the Christ, who has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now to the one who is able to do far more than we might ask or imagine, to God be the glory. And the blessings of God, Almighty Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest and abide upon us all, now and evermore. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you, my friends.